everybody doing today? All right, happy Sunday. We're so glad you're here. If you'd like to stand with us, we're going to get started with worship. If you're joining us online, welcome. We're so happy to have everybody here. Let's sing the There is Joy in the House of the Lord this morning. Step, I can 
that washes over us. Amen. His love is fierce and undeniable. All right, if you'd like to be seated, it's time for announcements. Everybody say good morning to Kevin. Good morning. What's up? Welcome to the well. What's up, bro? You want some? This guy, got to deal with him all the time. This is my son, Caleb, and I'm Kevin. <laughs> I'm just He's a great guy. Uh, but, man, welcome to the well. I'm not, my dad. <laughs> I'm not his. <laughs> I tried to adopt him, and his real parents said no. So there's that. If you have a kid who wants to be adopted, send him my way. I need my lawn mode. But, uh, no, for real, man, this is a great place. And I hope that you feel the same. I hope if you're a guest, if you're a visitor, I hope that you just enjoy coming to the well. Or, or it's your first time, and you're like, all right, I see the weird people, but church is cool. And, and um, we're a church that opens the Bible and we read it and we believe it and we let it lead our lives and we're chasing it. We want to take the gospel as far as we can. So I hope you feel that and I, I hope that you see that. Um, it was a great week, a long, crazy week for some people. And, and uh, if you went and served at Love Modesto or Love Empire, thank you so much. If you were praying and supporting, thank you so much. Uh, there was a lot. We'll have some pictures next week and some slides. Um, I didn't, I'll, can I be honest with the church today? I went to Taco Fest last night instead of preparing pictures to show this morning. So I had to weigh it out and I figured you could wait a week to see some pictures. So uh, I love tacos. I really do. Um, and, and speaking of food, we're going to do communion in just a little bit. So I'm going to get you some time. If you don't have one of these, uh, raise your hand. We'll get you one if you want to do communion with us. Um, if you're a believer and you're like, I would like to do communion. 
we have them. So if you need them, we'll get them, uh, and we'll do that in just a few minutes. But a couple things, if you are newer or a guest or just checking us out, we have connection cards, and, and we can swap some information. Uh, we don't have a great gift for you except for, we do, a bag in the back, and it's a nice bag and has some goodies in there. Uh, I got a compliment from a friend yesterday. He goes, dude, my mom gave me the mug that you guys gave her. Amazing. So if you don't know, you're going to get a really amazing mug if you're newer. <laughs> so they really are really nice. So uh, I was surprised to hear that. So um, they are nice. They actually are nice. But uh, anyways, uh, we use these to sign up for stuff, for prayer requests, for praises. Just a great way to, to see what's happening, what's coming up at the well couple things. Um, God hears her, ladies. There's something for you coming. It, this is uh, on March 14th in two weeks. It, Saturday, Saturday, sorry, man, dude, it's been a long week. I love that you're listening. That means so much to me. May 14th. May 14th. I, I always say June and January, so we're messed up. But yeah, so if you want to join the potluck, uh, you could sign up. You can use the back of the connection card um, and do that. And so uh, that's coming up. It'll be a great time of hanging out. Desserts. Like I always say, if you want me to test your food and make sure it's all right, I'm willing. Always willing. I, I'll tell you when it's bad, but I will definitely tell you when it's good. So um, plenty of stuff coming. So I know one of my favorite things is to watch the UFC fights or fighting in general. And I know you go, what? That's weird. They're professionals and they know what they're doing. They're getting in, in a cage to fight each other. Um, and I know that's not everybody's thing, but I've been trying some out of the box stuff and our church is willing to try some stuff out and go, hey, let's throw something out there and see if it works. So, so we're gonna fight. Me and Tim are boxing next week. I told him he can only stand in one spot because if I move, I'll fall over. So it's gonna, we're gonna be like, it's gonna be really funny. He'll probably, he'll probably just do this and I'll fall flat on my back. And <laughs> but, but with that, I get it. Not everyone likes the fights. But I thought, you know what? I watch the fights a lot all the time. And I love having people to my house. But my internet is terrible. And it, we lose a lot of the fights. So I go watch it on Twitter. Um, so I thought, you know what? I'm just going to go to the church and start watching the fights. So I asked him, and said, hey, can we invite some people and just hang out and watch the fights on, on Saturday night? So um, because the ladies have God here, sir, I thought, why don't I invite some guys? So ladies, you don't get to watch the fights with us. This week anyway. If you want in a couple weeks and you really are sad that you didn't get to watch them this week, the wolf, maybe we'll figure it out and we'll put them up here. But anyways, this, yeah, that's right. So here's what we'll do. We'll figure some food out. We have a couple guys that like to barbecue, but we're just going to hang out and watch the fights in the youth room. We got a few TVs and the chairs are okay. It'd be a nice hangout. The internet's really good sometimes. Um, but, uh, Guys, if you want to do that, uh, catch me in the courtyard or I'll send out a, a blurb, but we'll be out there from like, I don't know, 6.30 to when they're over. Um, but uh, man, we just want to do things and we want to hang out. And community, I, I saw so much happening yesterday in different spots of Love Empire. And you just go, there are so many people. We had 78 volunteers in Empire, which was humongous, above our expectations, so amazing. But the realization was maybe 10% of that 10 people were from Empire that weren't a part of somebody already being invited or just walking up or just signing up online because of the signs, which is a good thing. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And it's going to grow and it's going to get better. And everyone was, was just talking about how the community just needs more togetherness. One of the things that I am learning so much about that town is the people who've moved there, or they love it. It has a lot of issues and it has a lot of stuff and we're working and me and Tim met with some people yesterday and just hearing what they need but what they truly need is a deeper community than they have and we're gonna do communion today and that is 100% about deeper community with us as a church saying we're gonna to come together and we're gonna do this but also um, just about our own connection with God and so as, as I as I get ready to take us into a time of communion. Um, I say this often when I do communion time, but uh, I'm going to read from the message paraphrase today. Um, and this is, this is how uh, it, it, was, it was phrased. When it was time, he sat down with the, all the apostles with him, and he said, you have no idea how much I've looked forward to eating this Passover meal with you before I enter my time of suffering. It's the last one I'll eat until we all meet it until we all eat it together in the kingdom of God. 
I don't know how you live your life day to day. I don't know if you think much about the future, but the last few years we've had a ton of loss. Imagine if you knew the last time you would sit down with your family or your friends and you would share a meal. And Jesus knew what was coming and what was on the other side of that and that he was going to the cross, not just that he was going to pass away, but he was going, choosing to go to the cross through God's will and die for our sins. And he eagerly awaited that day. So maybe I can encourage you with, find some people to do dinner with. Find some people to spend some time together and do something together and just say, you know what? I've been looking forward to this day. We put it on the calendar and I've been looking forward to this day just hanging out with you. And maybe through that there's a gospel conversation or there's some communications that's talked. Uh, towards the end of the event yesterday, I was standing there and, and a guy about my size, probably about 60 pounds heavier, really, I was like, I hope this doesn't go bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, he looks at me in the face and he goes, you're the guy from the video. And I was like, I sure am. <laughs> and I'm like, God. Mm. And he said, I wanted to see what it's about. I just moved here. I'm a new homeowner. I moved into town and, and I just wanted to know what's happening here. And he said, you know what? I moved to Empire and it hasn't been good so far. He had some vandals mess with some of his stuff. And it was, we had a great conversation. We started talking. And you know what he was searching for? A little deeper community. A deeper community to see what are we doing. And I said, man, I, this is how God works. I had ordered ice cream from, from a, a place in town. And they do this thing called enrich and employ. And they help people who are special needs or just have a hard time being in a work environment, who've come out of addiction or whatever, and they help train them and get them ready for work. And as me and this guy were talking, he says, I'm trying to get my son a job, but he has trouble taking orders from people, listening to people. And I was like, God, you are so crazy. And I was like, man, can I text you something? And he's like, yeah, sure. I go, look at this. And I showed him on my phone this thing. And I'm like, how, how? I go, I don't, I've never heard of this ministry. I've never heard of this company, how they do this, what they do. And I said, this might be a great fit for your son. When you're willing to be community and be bigger and greater and go, God moves. And so as we enter in communion today, I, I, the biggest thing that God says is just to clear your heart. Be ready to enter into communion. Move the stuff aside that would hold you back from having right relationship or messes us up from, from wherever we're entering communion into. But those gospel conversations come when we say we want to be a better community for whoever's close to us. There's, we all have someone right there with us who need to be in community. So, or maybe we have someone who may be scary or look scary or your neighbor, you're like, oh, that guy. Ask God to just open your heart and, and open the door for that. So um, as we get ready to take communion, in, in, in that story, Jesus says, take this as representation of my body. And, and this is me offering myself, but also as we hang out and remember that, God, he literally came and did everything he said he would and proved who he was. So as we take this, that's the, the memory. And then as he was passing the cup, he said, this is the new covenant. This removes the sacrificial system. This takes away A long journey to have right relationship I'm gonna die on the cross once and for all for all of your sins and we have to go back and ask for forgiveness and repentance and work through all of that but he says as you take this remember that what I've done for you we have an we have an amazing Savior we have an amazing God who loves us and cares for us and knows our needs and our wants and our desires, and he wants to walk side by side. So as I pray, I just ask that you would just ask God to encourage your heart today or just draw someone out that, that needs to understand what the gospel truly is in your lives. God, I thank you for this church and that we can be who we are and that we get to read your word and, and see what it says. And it says, be community, be together, work together, go and spread the gospel. Tell people who you are. And God, random conversations come up when we're willing to do that and I pray for that man's son 
I pray for his family. I don't know if he's a Christian or not, God, I pray. We all have people in our lives that we run into week to week that just need us to be praying for them, that need us to be willing to just talk and open our doors and spend time. And through that, God, your love shows and your spirit moves. And I just pray and ask that that's what we see and we feel as we, we, we challenge ourselves to do what you'd call us to do. Thank you for this church and the amazing just care and, and vision that we have. And God, just bless the rest of the service as we sing songs to you and we hear your word. And, and God, I'm, I'm so happy and blessed to be a part. And I just thank you for everything you're doing in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. is just Jesus. So let's sing, Give Me Jesus. I've tasted and seen, yet questioned it all, still
Jesus, Lord, you are all that we need, everything we want. At the end of it all, as long as we have you, there is nothing else in this world that we need. And we, Father, we trust you. Even in times that we can't see, we're going to trust the hand that is holding us because we know that you are a good God. We thank you for today, and I pray for Tim as he comes to deliver yet another incredible message. Father, that you will just bless him and bless this congregation with what you have for us this morning. We thank you for today, and thank you for who you are. Just give us Jesus this morning. Amen. Amen. Now, before you're seated, look around the room. Maybe say hi to somebody. Um, since we have a southern flair here at our church, say howdy. You know, howdy, okay? And, and wave to everybody that's on camera as well. We welcome you this morning. So thank you. You can be seated. Glad that you're here today. Uh, it's always dangerous when we do that because you want to have hour-long conversations. Um, what an incredible week that it's been at the Well Community Fellowship. Last Monday, we hosted close to 70 leaders from all over Northern California for a day of training for pastoral leaders, and it was incredible. And I can't tell you the number of people that came up to me and they said, what an amazing church the well is. Um, and the team that you just put stuff on, and everybody just feels welcome when they come here. And that, that's, you know, um, good job. I mean, all I can say is good job, and let's continue to be that type of church where we make everybody feel like that they're at home, right? There's something special about coming home. So a place you can call home, the Well Community Fellowship, right? So uh, proud of that. Uh, also, um, I, I was a little disappointed. I came up early. I got up really early yesterday morning to work on today's message. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I was going to shortchange you. Because I've been struggling. What, what should I speak on? And um, I thought, you know what? I'll go back to my sermon files from 2017. They won't remember anyway. <laughs> um, and then woke up a little convicted about that and said, no, I can't do that. And so I, I got up early yesterday morning because I wanted to be up here for... Love Empire and Love Stanislaus. And so uh, got over to Empire and I was disappointed with what I saw. Not disappointed in what I saw, I was disappointed for me. You know why? I was not needed. <laughs> there were so many people that were there doing the community garden, I thought, well, this is ridiculous. I should be needed. And so I felt kind of bad about it. And I walked around and I talked to different people and then it hit me, boom. Um, this is exactly how it's supposed to be. And so I'm thankful for Kevin and his team, for Jessica and her team, for all of you who helped. Um, I was not needed. So I, I drove around trying to take pictures at different locations of where I could find people that were doing either Love Modesto or Love Empire. I came over here to the church for a while. And then God placed upon my heart, Tim, why don't you just drive around the Empire for a while? It doesn't take long, by the way. <laughs> and pray. I mean, you're challenging people to pray. So I stopped at where the churches were in town in their parking lots. And then one, one of the churches where I was sitting there in my truck praying, a guy's like, what are you doing? <laughs> so we struck up a conversation and I met many wonderful people and I'm excited about what it is that we may be able to do in the future to help that community, right? So um, thank all of you who, who've supported that. And so it was awesome. Yeah. Um, I've never battled with allergies until I moved to California. And I don't know if you're feeling bad today, but I am telling you what, uh, you're going to have to bear with me a little bit, okay? Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, so as I say, in the two hours I have, battle with me. <laughs> um, the importance of being prepared is very significant. 
Um, I was joking with our team. We meet for a few minutes before we start service and we pray together. We walk through what the order of the service is going to be. And I hadn't planned on sharing this with you all, but I shared it with them. So I'll share it with you so you're not missing out. Um, a pastor friend of mine, uh, kind of a mentor and um, just a really good guy. Uh, where, where I grew up, when you were in church, uh, there would be several times during the service where there would be different prayers, and you had to be prepared because you, would, you could be called upon to pray. So, for instance, Sheila, I would say, Sheila, would you lead us in prayer? How would that, how would that make you feel? I mean, you'd be scared to death, right? Uh, so you had, you had, hey, it kept you awake. Um, and, and so you could be called upon to pray at any time. And everybody was nervous. I mean, am I going to be called upon to pray? So this pastor friend of mine, um, he's pastoring a church. And he has a parishioner who is notorious for sleeping during the service. How many of you are sitting beside somebody that, that by the way, I see it, so don't fake it. One of the things that I don't like is when you greet me after the service and you say, great sermon, and I'm going to say, okay, did you hear it in your dreams or what? Because I noticed you were sleeping pretty hard. And, and that, you know, um, and so this guy was notorious for sleeping during the service. And he was actually snoring during the service when his wife, boom, elbowed him really hard. He thought that he was being called upon to pray. This was in the middle of the sermon. And so he gets elbowed. And in the middle of uh, Pastor Dwight's sermon, this guy stands up and begins to pray and thank God for the great service. And so Dwight says, well, okay, I guess we're dismissed then. And so they just left. Anybody want to pray and leave? Uh, the importance of being prepared. Uh, if you're going to take a trip somewhere, um, you'll consider different things about the trip. One of the things, if you're smart, if you're going to take a trip somewhere, uh, is, is you want to know, you ask this question, what's the weather going to be like? Or if I'm going to go speak somewhere, I want to know, what's the dress code? Are you okay with jeans? Or do I have to wear a jacket? Do I have to wear a suit? Uh, I've got to go somewhere in a couple of weeks, and that's my concern. I'm, I'm going to have to go buy a suit, I guess, because, you know, the others, they're big on me now. So um, the importance of what you wear and, and your dress code. I remember my first trip when I moved to California. I, I, when, when I came to California, I had the mindset that it was warm everywhere in California. I mean, that's the image that we have. The, uh, I didn't realize how cold the water was on the West Coast. Um, I, I, I didn't realize that, for instance, my first trip to San Francisco, I always saw it as something that was beautiful and warm. So my first trip to San Francisco, I nearly froze to death. <laughs> Wasn't it um, Mark Twain that said the coldest summer that he ever, or the coldest winter that he ever experienced was summer in San Francisco? Um, the importance of what you wear and your, your dress coat. We think about that when it comes to life, but what about our spiritual lives? So over the next six to seven weeks, we're going to dive deep into a passage in Ephesians chapter 6 in the New Testament where we hear about the dress code for those who are followers of Christ. Let me give you the background. If you want to try to find that book in the New Testament, Ephesians, we're going to be in chapter 6. Um, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus, a good church. They were known for their love. Uh, Paul is in prison when he writes this. This is one of four of his prison letters called the prison epistles or letters. He wrote Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Everybody say Philemon. That's a fun book to say. Philemon. Who would name their son Philemon? Um, so, um, and, and then you have this church at Ephesus. 
And probably what has happened, he's in prison and he's probably shackled to a prison guard and he's looking at the prison guard and what the prison guard is wearing and the Apostle Paul then takes what he is seeing and he writes to the church at Ephesus about something that's very significant and how you have to dress yourself as a follower. He writes this, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Finally... Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. Now, that phrase there, take your stand, is an interesting phrase um, because the Roman guards were notorious for wearing spikes on the bottom of their shoes, kind of like what we would call cleats today so that they could stand firm in the midst of battle and not be taken back like I'll do Kevin on fight night. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a sight to see Kevin? I'm... Him falling over, me can't stand up half the time. I mean, we would both end up with black eyes and not even touch each other. <laughs> you remember a few weeks ago when that happened actually. So so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces in the heavenly, uh, of evil in the heavenly realms. How, how many of you would say, okay, yeah, I understand what he's saying there. Our, our, our struggle is against people with authority. <laughs> no comments. Uh, He says in verse 13, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, not if, but when it comes, you may be able, there's that word again, to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, here it is again, to stand. Here it is again, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So over the next few weeks, like I said, six or seven weeks, we're going to take each part of that and we're going to talk about it. Today is just kind of like an introduction and I'm going to give you some observations that I want to make in preparation for us getting ready to be dressed up. First observation is this. We are in a spiritual battle. Again, back in verses 11 and 12, I'm just going to read it again. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Right now, whether we're conscious of it or not, there is a battle going on for your soul. And and Jesus wants to lead us to life everlasting, but Satan is trying to destroy us, friends. And he's not fictitious. Some people say that Satan is just the dark side of your personality. No, that's not what Jesus taught and Scripture teaches. He's real, and His goal is to deceive. His goal is to scheme against you. His goal is to get you to believe that Jesus, the Bible, that God's will is irrelevant in your life. One of His greatest weapons, though, may not even be evil. I've learned over the course of my life that one of Satan's greatest weapons that he uses to destroy us is distraction. If he can get you distracted from God's will in your life, he's won. Another tool that he often uses is apathy. 
where you just stop caring. Or maybe one of his weapons would be busyness. Have you ever wondered why when you're trying to get your life together, things get difficult? Have you ever wondered, okay, I'm going to start, I, I, I'm going to make God a priority in my life, and all of a sudden life starts to get a little bit more difficult? You know why that is? My dad used to say it this way, boy, if you ain't, uh, if, if the devil ain't bothering you, then you ain't bothering the devil. He wants to take us out. That's why spiritual growth is so difficult at times. It's why when you want to think, well, maybe I should serve in a ministry at the church, and then you realize you don't have enough time. Uh, you want to start giving generously, and then you, you know, you know that you have to put God, if you're a follower of Jesus, put God first in your finances, and, and, and you know, okay, I'm going to try this. I, I'm actually going to give God priority in what I give, and then all of a sudden you start to have financial difficulty. You get challenged a few times a year here at the church to be involved in a growth group, a small group, where you can connect, as Kevin said during communion, you can connect in a community with people, but all of a sudden you don't have time? You ever noticed how you're challenged to forgive somebody? But the hurt is so big you just can't seem to do it? Do any of you have any habits here? Bad habits? Anybody? How many of you are sitting beside somebody that has a bad habit? Raise your hand. And how when you try to start working on that, it suddenly is almost impossible to overcome? There's a battle going on, friends. Right now in this room, listen. There's a battle going on for your soul. You have to get dressed up. I mean, how many of you, like me, have been terribly saddened by what we're seeing in the Ukraine? And almost on a daily basis, we see the UK, Ukrainian president, President Zelensky. What does he keep asking for? We need help. We need more weaponry to defend ourselves. The same is true in our spiritual lives. We need weaponry to defend ourselves, and Ephesians chapter 6 gives us that. Satan is out to destroy. In this passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul says that he is scheming. Which means, by the way, that he is, he's using trickery. Are you with me? He's using trickery to try to get you and me off track. Just this last week, I was watching on ESPN. Um, sorry for those of you that don't like sports. If you don't, we'll get over it. Uh, so on ESPN, they were, they, were, they were talking about one of the greatest uh, trick plays that was ever done. And they were, they were, it had to do with Florida State Seminoles, and they were playing Clemson. And for weeks and weeks and weeks, how Bobby Bowden, who happened to be a West Virginia boy, by the way, Bobby Bowden, who coached at West Virginia, by the way, but Bobby Bowden had planned for weeks this, this trick play um, called the Puntarooski. You, you can look it up. Don't worry about it. But, and they actually ended up winning a game because they tricked the other team. That's what Satan wants to do to you and me. He wants to do a punteruski. He wants you to think one thing, and he's going to trick you to defeat you. Jesus said this in John 10.10. 10. He says, the thief, speaking of Satan, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. So Satan does it with deception. Let me give you one more illustration of how Satan kind of does his thing. And I'm going to gross you out. Are you ready for this? So if you need to plug your ears, I'll give you the PG-13 warning. I read about how 
um, Eskimos in Alaska kill wolves. And so, already, hey, I see it already. So what they'll do is they'll take a very sharp double-edged knife, keep covering it in blood and letting it freeze, and keep covering it in blood and let it freeze, keep covering the knife in blood and let it freeze, and then they'll stick it in the snow. When a wolf comes and smells the blood, begins to lick the blade. And after a while, what will happen is that the wolf does not even realize that it's sliced into its own mouth and is tasting its own blood until it bleeds to death. Gross, right? That's what Satan does to us. He preys on our desires until we keep licking and licking and licking at our desires that are ungodly until we are spiritually dead. First Peter 5 8 says, Be alert and sober minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I don't know if you've ever seen this in the wild. I have. I've been on a safari in Africa. And I've watched as I couldn't even see them. But the driver, our guide, was pointing out Do you see that lion over there? Hidden in the grass? No. Watch. He's after that gazelle. And you just watch, laying around, waiting, prowling to devour. So remember, you are in a spiritual battle. Battle. A second observation that I would make is this. In order to win the battle, you have to be properly equipped. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying here. You have to be properly equipped. You're in a war. So he says twice, look at this, put on the full armor of God in verse 11 so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He says it again, verse 13, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground and after that you've done everything to stand. He repeats it twice. Repeats it twice. Put on the full armor of God. Why? I think of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. Now Jesus, He started His ministry when He was age 30. And, and at the beginning of His ministry, He goes and He's baptized by John. And He hears this voice from heaven. A dove descends upon Him. And the voice says this, what? This is My Son whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. Do you know what Jesus did immediately after that? He went into the wilderness, the desert, where he spent 40 days fasting. 40 days fasting. Let me, 40 days fasting. And here's what I think is funny in Matthew chapter 4, verse 2, it says, After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. You think? When I was in seminary, I brought that up in a class and there happened to be a medical doctor who was going back into seminary and he says, well, you know, it is possible that you're not hungry um, when you begin to fast. And I said, dude, I, I, I can hardly go for a couple hours, 40 days. He was then hungry. Uh, verse 3 says, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Where did Satan first tempt Jesus? At his weakest point. Maybe you are familiar with Greek mythology. I love Greek mythology when I was in uh, doing English studies, and I love mythology. Uh, let's see if you know who this character would be. I'm not going to tell you. you. You may be able to figure it out, but this character in Greek mythology... Um, his parents wanted him to be invincible. And so what they did is they were told by the gods that if they would take their son and dip him into the river Styx, that he would be invincible. So mom grabbed him by the foot, dipped him into the river Styx, and he became an amazing warrior until he got killed one day with a single arrow to the back of his hill 
Anybody guess what his name was? Achilles. Achilles. How many of you learned something you didn't know right there? Okay. And so we even use that phrase today, you know, uh, the, the Achilles tendon is the strongest tendon in your body. And, 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 but we, we say that if somebody has a weak spot, we call it their Achilles heel. What's yours? Because Satan's going to shoot for it. Just like with Jesus, Jesus, Satan came after him at his weakest point, his hunger. I just wrote down six, I think, six common areas of weaknesses that I see many of us struggle with. One is pride. This is a big one, actually. Our pride keeps us from loving and serving others. Our pride keeps us from saying, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Our pride keeps us from seeking forgiveness. Our pride makes me think too highly of myself. Pride gives me eyes to see the faults of others while I am ignoring my own. Can, oh, you're quiet. Come on, folks. Are you with me this morning? Pride keeps me from addressing my weaknesses. Another area, I think, where it may be an Achilles heel for us is our thoughts. We, we often will think the wrong thing, so we fret and we worry. As I've said before, our thoughts are simply rehearsal for our actions. I've said before, our lives are always headed in the direction of our strongest thoughts. So you want to know where your life is headed? Examine what you're thinking. I'll tell you another weakness for many of us is our mouths. Our words. How many of you know somebody that has trouble with that? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at the number of people that have told me recently that they've been put in Facebook jail. <laughs> have any of you? Oh, okay, well. <laughs> so, gossip, slander, and Satan tries to trick us into saying, I'm just venting. For others, the Achilles heel may be your habits. You have patterns that you know that are not godly, and you say, well, it's my life. For others, the Achilles heel may be selfishness. After all, the world really revolves around me. For others, it may be discouragement. We actually fool ourselves or Satan deceives us into believing that life is supposed to be easy when Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome this world. So the antidote, according to Ephesians 6, is to put on the full armor of God. Not partially clothed, but you dress up. One final observation before we close this morning is this. That the armor shields me, but the Lord strengthens me. So I put on the armor, but I have to realize that underneath the armor, in my heart is somebody who would be strengthening me. Verse 10 says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. So I have a responsibility to clothe myself. And we're going to look at these, these areas as the weeks go on. We're going to look at each one individually. I, I have a responsibility to clothe myself, but I also know that my strength is not found in what I do, but my strength is found in the Lord and His mighty power. We can't stand up against the devil's schemes in our own power. We have to be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. And we cannot have the Lord's power if He's not our Lord. Which means He's the boss. Earlier in Ephesians chapter 1, it's a great book. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19, the Apostle Paul says, "...the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to all who believe." Hear that. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to all who believe. Ephesians 1, 19. Uh, the same power 
that raised Jesus from the dead. Resurrection power is available to anyone who believes. Our strength is in the Lord. I don't know if I've shared this with you before. I, I, you know, I share a lot, but if you notice my elbow, I have a pretty nice scar here. This happened when I was eight years old. And for coal miners' kids, every week um, you were able to attend a two-week camp that you would go to for coal miners' kids, and it was just a, a youth camp. It was tons of fun, and you learned all kinds of stuff. The first year that I went, I'd been at camp for one week, and it was two weeks. And it was raining that day. And so when it was downpouring like that, they wouldn't let us go outside, so we were inside of our cabin. And I had a top bunk. And we were joking around one day. I took my belt off, and I was playing fishy fishy. You know what that is, right? With the boy that was on the bottom bunk. Fishy fishy is I was trying to pull him up. You know, I'd drop down my belt and go, here, fishy fishy, get it? And he grabbed on, and I'm pulling and pulling and pulling, trying to get him. The, the counselor wasn't in, in there. We were joking, you know. I wasn't always a good guy, I'm just saying, okay? And so I was pulling and pulling and pulling, and I saw the counselor coming, and I'm like, you need to let go about the time I pulled. And I went off the other side of the bunk and landed on my elbow, and it was a terrible break and dislocation. I was two hours away from home. They ran me over to the infirmary, put me into a Volkswagen Beetle, drove me to the nearest hospital where I had to wait. They called my parents and they gave permission over the phone for them to do emergency surgery. But they wanted to wait until my mom and dad got there. They had me in a hallway and I'm by myself, eight years old, and then I still remember when I saw mom and dad and I heard mom's voice Timmy you're going to be okay the pain was still there two surgeries two weeks in the hospital the pain was still there but I was able to endure and thrive because of the presence of someone who loved me and encouraged me and strengthened me. Scripture says that when you become a follower of Christ, He gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit that resides within you. Now, that doesn't mean that we live problem-free. Jesus said, in this life you're going to have problems. The, the word for Holy Spirit in the New Testament Greek is the word paraclete. And do you know what that means? The one who walks along beside. In this world, we will have trouble. But take heart, Jesus has overcome the world and He's given us His blessed Holy Spirit who walks along beside us while Satan is doing his evil schemes. We find our strength in the Lord and in His mighty power. So where are you today? Some of you are experiencing some spiritual battle. Um, some of you are followers of Jesus and you've just... you've allowed Satan to deceive you and move you away from him. Today, would you recommit your life to him? Some of you may be here and you've never committed your life to Christ. I'm telling you, you've got an evil one that's out after your soul. Find your strength in the Lord. Ask Him into your life. Commit your way to follow Him. And that today, friends, is the word of the Lord for us. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for our time together in Ephesians. And in the weeks to come, we pray that You would help us to understand and grasp more fully what it means to be dressed up with the armor of God. For those who may be here today and they're under 
they understand that they're in a deep spiritual battle, um, you would strengthen them. They would find their strength in you. Uh, for some who are here who have drifted away from that closeness with you and uh, they're, they're listening to the deceiver, God, bring them back. Bring them back. Bring them back. And maybe for those who are here today and they've never accepted you as their Lord and Savior, today would be the day that they would say, okay, I'm going to commit my life to you. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus, our wonderful Savior. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here today. We're going to close with one final song. Um, if you brought your, we want you, your connection cards, you can put those in the basket and the table in the back and any offering you may have brought, but you can always give online. And friends, I'm telling you, uh, we're so appreciative of you giving. And we've got so many wonderful things that we've got planned as we move forward that can't happen without your generosity. So thank you so much for your generosity. So love you all. Thanks for being here. Let's stand together and let's sing this final song. Thanks, Tim. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, I am a child. God, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, I am a child of God.
child of God. just sit in that this week that you are a child of the living God. Amen. All right, you guys, we love you so much. Have a wonderful week. See you next time. If you joined us online, see you again. God bless.